Thank you. We don't actually, I'm sorry. I Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
You know, it's just to, to push this is to go. Thank you so much. Okay, that's perfect. You're always here in the best seat of the house. Are you going to start? I'm going to stand over here. Okay. Can you reach up on the seat? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody with an acting type of 
person, but I'm in both government. So you can imagine how excited um, Rankin was when he discovered the X-ray, right? I wish I could have discovered something really important as the X-ray. So the next is our book. He writes about it, and we should write our article like this. The date of this article is February 15, 1896. And this is how it's written. It goes, in the course of some experiments on the Rankin rays, I have hit upon a series of such extraordinary effects that I hasten to place them on record without further loss of time, believing them to be of the utmost importance. Right? We should write like that. Has anyone written a paper like that? Right. We should, it would be so nice to read papers like that. It would be exciting and palpable. So that was February 15, 1896. And by May 30th, 1896, less than four months later, he described a 22-year-old who was riding his horse who pulled off of it in the horse that shot him. They assumed that he had blood in his brain because he's becoming unresponsive, and his elbow is swollen. And they take this picture. So four months later, they put two and two together and say, not only can this, this machinery take pictures of coins and keys, let me use it on a person. How long would that take in modern day society if we come up with an invention to see through people? How would you test it? Right? It would take 10 years. But in four months, they went from being used on coins and keys to being used on patients to diagnose an elbow dislocation and then it being a new position. Right? So amazing time um, that they lived in. I'm going to go to the next slide. So when we look at an x ray in the next slide still, we have to be able to count. Oh, sorry. No worries. We have to be able to count the waves. Because when I communicate with you about a nodule that I see or a rib fracture, I have to be able to tell you what level I'm seeing the time and why. So I'd like to show you um, the ribs. Like how when I started looking at ribs, I started going like this. I used to go first rib, <laughs> second rib, third rib, but that made me dizzy. A better way to look at ribs is to look at the back of the ribs first. So this is the back of the first rib. This is the back of the second, the back of the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh, the twelfth. And notice how the back of the ribs slope down and out. Do you appreciate that? Whereas the front of the ribs, here's the front of the ribs, slopes down and in. So here's the first anterior rib on the right. The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and then we can't see them so well. So you can identify, everybody think in their mind where the, the go to the slide before this, the left fifth, left fifth posterior rib is. But for my report, I tell you that there's a nodule over the left fifth posterior rib. Can you in your mind's eye count that from here? Pick what you think is the left fifth posterior rib. It's easier said than done. But here's the beginning of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So this is the left fifth posterior rib. Now look to find the left third anterior rib. Okay? Think about where it is, and then I'll point it out to you. Okay, so this is the... The first, the second, the third anterior rib. Okay, and it can be important at times when I want to be able to communicate with you what I'm seeing on the radiograph and for you to be able to find it too. And then the next slide, and the next slide. The lateral view, sometimes these two lines overlying the lateral view can be confusing. Those represent the scapula and not the alarm by the. Okay, females are different than males in so many ways, and on the chest x ray also, female ribs end in a V. Do you see that? The costal cartilage of a female rib calcifies in the center and ends in a V. So it becomes pointed like a V at the end of it. Now look at the next x-ray. Men are different. Men's costal cartilage calcifies on the outside and it ends up looking like a W. So a difference between the sexes, right? So on the, on the x-ray, you can see the sex of the patient based on the, the way the ribs end. Rib fractures. There are three rib fractures on the right here. Can you identify them? Usually, they're in a stepwise manner, so they're one on top of each other. You can have something pushing you from the outside that's going to fracture a bunch of ribs at the same time. Has anyone identified the three rib fractures? Yeah. So we see this right rib is here. fractured, this rib is fractured, and that rib is fractured. Can you count them for me? Now we're applying night, uh, uh, information from the prior slide. It can be challenging, okay? So I want you to give you one second. Seven, eight, nine. Oh. Very good. Yeah. 
When you are a uh, giving a lecture, you're supposed to wait five seconds before you uh, answer people's questions. If you ask a question, you're supposed to wait a full five seconds. I can never do that. I'm always like, I gotta tell you the answer. Very good at recognizing the fractures. And next one. Now this patient has two expansile lesions of the bone caused by multiple myeloma. Can you see them? One is on the right and one is on the left. The first one on the right is here of the, the seventh lateral rib. And this is the second anterior rib on the left. Next one. This patient has a deformity of their sternum. Notice how the sternum is pushed posteriorly. When you have this deformity of pectus excavatum, it sometimes looks like you have a right middle lobe pneumonia. So when you see pectus excavatum, I'm oh, sorry, I'll go over here. So I'm going to go ahead. You can, um, not to confuse right middle lobe pneumonia, um, pectus excavatum. Here's the cat scan of the pectus excavatum. Look at how the sternum is pushed backwards. Not only is it cosmetically a problem, but it can put pressure on the right um, atrium here, and then you need to surgically correct it. The index that we report to say how bad a pectus deformity is is called the Haller index. The Haller index is the measurement of the transverse dimension over the front to back dimension. And if it's greater than 2.5, that means the patient has a pectus excavatum. And the higher that number is, the larger, the more severe the pectus excavatum. This patient's scalp film has a lot of nodules. Do you know what this diagnosis is? Can you translate what you see clinically to this radiograph? It's a lymphangitic like set of left side breasts. So it could be <laughs> this patient definitely has axillary sacrals as a good thought. They ended up having neurofibromatosis. So there's a lot of um, nodules on the skin. And when we look at the CAT scan, they too have a pectus um, excavatum. Next slide. When we look at the heart, what do we say about the heart on a chest X-ray? Either it's big or normal, right? We never say it's really too small. Have you ever said the heart was too small? Probably not anecdotally. I can't remember when I've ever said it. But we can even say more information based on the chest X-ray. The right atrium makes up the right heart border. It's usually the same size as the vascular pedicle. As the right atrium gets bigger, it gets taller. The right ventricle makes up the floor of the heart. As the right ventricle gets bigger, what diseases are going to make the right ventricle bigger? Pulmonic stenosis, right? This apex of the heart, which is here, is going to move upwards and give you a boot-shaped heart, like you see with tetralogy up below. The left ventricle makes up the left heart border. As it gets bigger, it pushes the apex inferiorly. And the left atrium sits underneath here. Do you see the trachea here? And do you see? where the two bronchi are, and that's the carina. That is usually less than 90 degrees. When the left atrium increases, it splays the carina and makes the angle greater than 90 degrees. So this is a normal left atrium. Next slide. On the lateral view, the right ventricle is anterior. As it gets bigger, it grows upwards. And where this is usually black here, it becomes white when the right ventricle gets big. The left atrium is posterior. <laughs> This line, do you see that little line right there? Is the inferior vena cava. When the left ventricle gets big, it bulges behind the inferior vena cava. The left atrium bulges posteriorly also. So what is right here? These are classifications right here. It would be the mitral valve, because it's between where the left atrium and the left ventricle is located. And that's the inferior vena cava. Okay, so this patient has a big heart or a regular heart? It's on the big side. Notice how the um, carina is splayed. So this patient has an enlarged left atrium. And where are we going to see that on the lateral? We see the bulging posteriorly up high. Left ventricle is a little bit down lower. So this is left atrial enlargement. Next slide. Here, patient, what do we see? We see sternotomy wires. We see um, a valve in the pulmonary artery. We see that this patient had obliteration of the retrosternal space. So which chamber of the lung is enlarged here? Right. right ventricle, right? So when the right ventricle gets big, it goes upward and it takes over the space here that used to be black, now it's white. Also, the apex of the heart is elevated, including with right ventricular enlargement. Next one is going to be a challenge. What's big here, right? So we can check it chamber by chamber. Is the right atrium big? that makes up this part, right? Look how much taller it's become. Is the right ventricle big, obliterating the retrosternal space? 
is the left atrium bridge splaying the carina, and is the left ventricle bridge pushing the apex of the lung inferior and bulging backwards. So the, all the chambers are enlarged, and we can identify them on the chest X-ray. One of these two masses is the patient who had the bad fortune of having big heart and two lung cancers. So that's a good thought when you see big pilar, bilateral pilar, and heart cancer. In this patient, they represent the pulmonary arteries, though, because everything is so big and they're in the path of it, the pulmonary arteries are big. This patient has pulmonary artery hypertension, and there's two types from a radiographic perspective. There's precapillary and postcapillary. When we think about precapillary, the cause we're going to think about are idiopathic and chronic pulmonary emboli. And postcapillary, we're going to think about aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, something growing in the left atrium, pulmonary venal occlusive disease. And the difference radiographically is going to be if there's pulmonary edema or not. If there's pulmonary edema, then it's going to be postcapillary because the veins are being distended. And if there's no pulmonary edema, no distended veins, then it's precapillary. Next slide. When you look at the x-ray, another thing you should look for is the direction of the trachea. Most tracheas go like this and then go a little bit to the right because the aortic arch is on the left. Do you see in this x-ray that the trachea is going a little bit to the left because this patient has a right aortic arch. And that might be helpful to know at times. This patient's heart, is it big? How is it different than the last patient's heart that was big? This patient's heart is big on the bottom. It's bottom heavy, right? Whereas the other heart was big in the middle. When you see that the bottom is heavy, then you've got to think it must be fluid going to the gravity dependent portion of the lung. So this is an Erlenmeyer flask shaped heart that's bottom heavy. On the lateral, which is very hard to see here, we see a black skinny line and a black skinny line. Do you see those? And in between them we see white. This is called the Oreo cookie sign, and it's representing the fat around the pericardium and the fluid in the pericardium. So that's not going to be seen all the time. A more reliable sign is the heaviness of the bottom. Or if you see somebody's heart rapidly getting bigger, you might suggest a pericardial effusion. And there it is on the CT scan. When we're looking at a chest x-ray, we should look at the costal phrenic angle and the cardial phrenic angle. It takes about 75 cc's of fluid to blunt the posterior costal phrenic angle on the lateral view. It takes 175 cc's to blunt the lateral costal phrenic angle on the frontal view. So if we don't see blunting, it doesn't mean that there's no pleural effusion. It means that there's not 175 cc's of pleural fluid. And when we see a pleural effusion, we should be able to at least be consistent with ourselves. So when I see a pleural effusion, if it just blunts the costophrenic angle with a small meniscus, I call it small. If it's so big that it doesn't allow me to see the diaphragm, I call it moderate. If I can't see the heart border, I call it moderate to large. And once it gets halfway up, I call it large. So at least I'm consistent with myself from a daily to day basis. I don't have to agree with everybody, but at least I should agree with myself. So here we have a large pleural effusion, right? And to differentiate pleural effusion from atelectasis, we're going to see which way the medial sternum is moving. Is this medial sternum moving more to the right or to the left? Left. So we know this is likely to be pleural effusion because atelectasis will be pulling it to the other side. And... Um, you notice on the lateral view, how many diaphragms do you see? One. We know this patient has two diaphragms. The other diaphragm is being silhouetted because the pleural effusion is so um, big, it's obscuring the, he the hemi diaphragm. So the silhouette sign occurs when you have something of same density of the lung or the same density anywhere touching each other. So because the pleural fluid is the same density as the, the liver or the diaphragm, we no longer see the interface between the two. That's why we only see one diaphragm on the lateral. Notice, go back to that for a second. On the lateral, how do we know that this is the left hemi diaphragm? We know it's not the right because we know the right is being silhouetted. The left hemi diaphragm characteristically only goes half the way forward because the heart's sitting on it and silhouetting it. So when you see two diaphragms, the one that you see only going part of the way is the left, and the one that you see going all the way is the right hemi diaphragm. And there's a small pleural effusion. Here we see, usually there's a sharp angle here called the cardiophrenic angle. This is being blunted. On the next slide. 
we see the reason for the Barnes and Nevis are these nodules, these lymph nodes, in the right cardiophrenic angle. When you see right cardiophrenic angle lymph nodes, oftentimes it means that the patient has liver disease. But this patient's right cardiophrenic angles are big because of Castleman's disease. You know this disease, right giant lymphadenopathy um, on the spectrum of lymphoma. Here we see that the right cardiophrenic angle is blunted as well. But unlike the prior case, you can see the blood vessels running through it. That means whatever's blunting it is relatively low density. And in this case, the next slide shows that it is fat permeating from up from the abdomen into the chest. So this is a hernia of the diaphragm with peritoneal fat above the diaphragm. Some other lines that we should look at on the x-ray are the right paratracheal stripe. This should only be four millimeters thick. We see that this Y is called the anterior junctional line. Can you appreciate it from over there? The anterior junctional line is the union of the pleura on the right and the pleura on the left in the front of the chest. So it's four layers of pleura thick. It's the anterior junctional line. Not to confuse it with a, a foreign body that somebody uh, ingested. This subtle line over here is called the azygoesophageal recess. It should be in the middle of the chest. And um, if it moves to the right, you have to worry about esophageal pathology or lymphadenopathy in the medial spinal. Okay, so this patient, what's wrong with their right paratracheal stripe? Do you see their right paratracheal stripe? Over here, it's very uh, thickened, right? <coughs> so there's a mass here. And on the next slide, we can see that the mass is fluid density. And this represents a bronchogenic cyst. Bronchogenic cysts like this location. Their favorite location is underneath the carina. And their second favorite location is along the right paratracheal stripe. What's wrong with this x-ray? Of those three lines, is it the right paratracheal stripe, the anterior junctional line, or the azygoesophageal recess that's wrong? Look at this azygoesophageal recess. It's being bulged all the way over here. Usually that should be in the middle. So we get a CAT scan. And it ends up that this is a thoracic duct. Usually the thoracic duct you can barely perceive, but this one is obstructed and infected and distended, causing the azygoal esophageal recess to bulge to the right. So on the x-ray, we made that diagnosis. The mediastinum, we looked at the anterior mediastinum, uh, depending on how you uh, evaluate it, the middle mediastinum and the posterior mediastinum. Next slide. Here the patient has a mass. You'd be hard pressed to say whether this was in the anterior, middle, or mediastinum from the frontal view. On the lateral view, you can see that it's an anterior located mass. What's your differential for an anterior mass? Thymoma, very common to see thymomas. Any other things? You put teratoma there, uh, lymphoma, T cell lymphoma, and uh, thyroid cancer. This patient had a heterogeneous mass in her anterior mediastinum with the malignant teratoma. Here we see a mass. Hard to see it on the frontal. But on the lateral, we can see it's in the middle mediastinum. Do you appreciate it there? This round mass. On the CAT scan, it was cystic, so it's a bronchogenic cyst. The differential diagnosis could include esophageal duplication cyst, but because bronchogenic cysts are so much more common, that if you had a guess for the region, you'd guess that it was a bronchogenic cyst. Someone said this diagnosis before with a big pulmonary artery, right? We see bilateral big pulmonary highlights. The pulmonary highlights should only measure 16 millimeters across. This one is maybe 40 millimeters across. So what is your differential for this patient? I had soft put up there. What else would you be worried about? <laughs> lymphoma would be something. Probably metastatic disease to the, the lymph nodes or lymphoma or sarcoid being your differential, the main things you'd be thinking about. Yesterday, we saw a patient with chronic granulomatous disease, though, that had huge lymphadenopathy. But the lymph nodes of soft quit are a little bit different than the lymph nodes of lymphoma. The lymph nodes of lymphoma are soft, so they would never leave this indentation between the hilum and the heart. They would lay on top of the heart. So when you see this indentation, that suggests that it's more stiff, the lymph nodes, and more like soft quit. These are supposed to look like potatoes. I don't know if I see them looking like potatoes. Do you? I don't know. That's what their analogy is to it. On the lateral, this is the trachea. This is the left upper lobe bronchus right here. The lymphadenopathy of sarcoid is going around the bronchus and it's supposed to look like a donut. So it's it's all about the food. It's potatoes, 
and donut to make the diagnosis of sarcoid. We should say with the, the uh, staging, the staging of sarcoid is coming out from the X-ray exam. So stage zero means that the patient maybe has cardiac sarcoid or skin sarcoid, sarcoid or sarcoid someplace else, but not in the chest. Stage one, this is stage one sarcoid. So there's just lymphadenopathy. Anyone know what stage two is? Lymphadenopathy and lymphadenopathy. Right, so there's two things wrong in stage two. So we have lymphadenopathy and pulmonary nodules. In stage three, the lymph nodes start to, to get smaller in size and we just have nodules in the lung parenchyma. And stage four, which is oftentimes the way we see the patients is fibrosis of the lung. Here there's a mass. It's located in the posterior in the lateral view. And on the next x-ray, this ended up being a schwannoma because it's coming from the nerve that's coming out of the spine here. Posterior view, the central mass here. And over here. And on the cat scan on biopsy, this was a lung cancer. Can anybody see the mass? Let me go over here so I can see the mass. Oh, you see the mass on the right side of the heart there? What's wrong with those vertebral bodies? Do they look like the squares or the normal rectangles in the middle of the thoracic spine? Right, so they have this indentation that's supposed to look like the mouth of a fish. This fish mouth vertebral body is classic for um, sickle cell anemia. So we have a patient that has um, sickle cell anemia, and you can look at the spine like here, it's very modeled. So this extra soft tissue density here represents extra medullary hematopoiesis, the body that wants to rectify um, the problem. And that can happen in the lung parenchyma itself, but here it's as a, a power of the tubal mass. Look at the marker in this case. Do you see where the marker is? It says right side versus left side. So what's wrong with that? That should be on this side, right? So the technologist hung the film the wrong way because he looked at what he knows to look correct, but it's not supposed to be this way. So you have to always be looking for what can go wrong, might go wrong, and you have to be a defensive driver about it and, and, and recognize it. So the next slide shows how it should be. This is the right way for hanging this. So this patient has a right-sided heart. Next slide, which we see on the CAT scan. But interesting enough, they have a liver that's in the middle. They have a spleen on the right, but how many spleens do they have? Seven spleens. So they have polysplenia. So when you see polysplenia, oftentimes that's associated with two left lungs. So back to the x-ray. Can we go back to the x-ray? This patient has a trachea and a left lung and a left lung. So they have two lobes here, two lobes here. This patient has two left lungs and multiple spleens. Do you know what the opposite of that is? What's the opposite of many spleens? No spleens. And what's the opposite of two left lungs? Two right lungs. You can't make this up. Just amazing. So the opposite disease is two right lungs with no spleen. So there's either a spleen or polysplenia in the two diseases. This patient has polysplenia. Who does better? Which disease would you rather have if they had a heart one? Polysplenia, right? The a spleen people do it dry younger. The, um, these people, polysplenia, usually die of cardiac anomalies. He was in his 60s, so I wrote him up because he was older than most patients live to, to be. On the lateral x-ray, before you put the, the x-ray down, you should look behind the sternum to make sure there's no masses. This triangle here that's made up by the back of the trachea and the front of the spine and above the arch of the aorta is called Rader's Triangle. You should look there and you should look behind the heart to see if there are masses. Here we see a patient that has an expanded retrosternal space. It's much bigger than normal. That's because the patient has emphysema. With emphysema, your lungs are becoming bigger, right, because your alveoli are filling with air. Look what happens to the diaphragm. So the retrosternal space is increasing. Here we see a patient, and if this is where there's triangle, there's usually nothing up here, but there's a mass on the lateral. When you see a mass in radius triangle, you think about a barrett right to pain and artery, but in this case, here's the patient's trachea and it's bowing because there's a thyroid mass. This thyroid mass is occupying the retrosternal space, and there it is on the back scan. Here we have 
a large mass behind the heart. Anyone know what this mass is? It's behind the heart. You see often, right, a hiatal hernia. So this is a huge hiatal hernia. A hiatal hernia is the only thing that causes mid line on a chest x-ray as seen on both sides of the lung, on the medial side. Can you imagine that we can, we can say as much as, this is the trachea. This white area in front of the trachea is the right pulmonary artery. This white area behind the trachea is the left pulmonary artery. Okay, so when you want to verify what you're seeing on the frontal, if you look on the lateral, everything in front of the trachea is the right pulmonary artery, and everything behind the trachea is the left pulmonary hilum. What do you see here? If you were reading this x-ray, you were taking care of your patient, you were very sick, what would you call it? Is there something fluffy like a cloud or something linear like reticulation? Fluffy like a cloud, right? And so this fluffy cloud-like stuff is being limited by this minor fissure. So it's in the right upper lobe. So there's something in the alveoli in the upper lobe that looks like a cloud. Acutely, your differential is a mnemonic peak. H is for hemorrhage, B is for edema, a is for alveolar proteinosis, which we don't see so commonly. I think we just need the A, and P is for pneumonia. So here we see something in the alveolar, and we see a pleural effusion. How big is that pleural effusion? Small, moderate? We don't really see the diaphragm. So a moderate pleural effusion, a paranormonic pleural effusion. Here there's some consolidation. I'm saying it's a right middle lobe pneumonia, which can be very challenging to make the diagnosis. Because the right middle lobe lives in its trial lobe here, this is right in the lower consolidation. It's easier to see on the lateral, where over the heart we see that it's increased whiteness here. So that's a right in the lower pneumonia. Do you see the consolidation here? Whenever we see lower lobe consolidation, we should entertain the diagnosis of aspiration, like this patient had. Here the patient has bilateral pneumonia. So this is not a low bar pneumonia spreading from one alveoli to the other alveoli through the pleural palm, but instead this pneumonia is spreading <coughs> through the airways and there's cavitation. So what would be your best diagnosis for cavitating bronchial pneumonia? What's the most common thing? Staph pneumonia you might think about um, in your differential with this cavitation. If you want to notice the cavitation. Here's a solitary mass with a mass in the level. So it is cavitating. This is an abscess. And on the PET scan, we look at the thickness of the wall of the cavity. If it's less than 5 millimeters, meaning very thin, it's likely to be infectious. If it's greater than 15 millimeters, it's likely to be cancer. And between 5 and 15, it's to be cancer. It can be fungal aspects of this. Yes, so it's such a long differential uh, diagnosis. What do you see here? Can anybody um, look in here? Where is the abnormality? Right side or left side mostly? It's mostly left. It's all Okay, good. So tuberculosis, right? So this is a very good one. Whenever you see something in the apex, you're going to think about tuberculosis. And I'll go to the next slide. We see some cavitation here. It's interesting how tuberculosis loves the back of the upper lobes and the top of the lower lobe. So whenever I see consolidation in the, that location, TB is highest on my list. That's where TB likes to go. Interesting, sarcoid likes to go there too. So we wonder about the overlap between sarcoid and tuberculosis. Lower down, tuberculosis gives you a classic tree and bud appearance. So you appreciate how these little nodules that are extending that represents endobronchial spread of the infection. Do you, we don't see too much asbestos anymore. I worked in Staten Island and we used to see it all the time, but in New York I don't see so much of it. Um, asbestos can give you total classifications. And then it gives you this subcoral line, which is the asbestosis. Pulmonary edema you see commonly, right? So we have to be careful when we call pulmonary edema on a portable x-ray because you really should never call pulmonary edema on a rated graph where the patient is not in down because there's equalization of flow. The first finding you see with pulmonary edema is that the blood vessels going to the upper lobes look bigger than the blood vessels going to the lower lobes. You see this on this x-ray? This is an upright x-ray. So these vessels are much more engorged with these vessels. So pulmonary vascular redistribution is the earliest finding. It represents mild pulmonary edema with a pulmonary capillary blood pressure from 15 to 18. The next finding we're going to see, which is not projected well, are curly beads. Curly beads are linear densities like this one. 
that are perpendicular to the chest wall that represent thickening of the interlobular septa. And the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures for these are about 18 to 25. And then the worst kind of pulmonary edema has a bat wing with bilateral fluffy clouds around the hyaline with the wedge pressure over 25. So this would be moderate Sorry. pulmonary edema. Next slide. When you look at this one, you notice immediately this line is the minor fissure. And usually it's over here, but now it's moved over to here. So this is right up below that electrosis. Next one. This diagnosis is hard to make, and it would be important for you to be able to make it all. So which side is the abnormal side on this x-ray? The left side, right? And the reason it's abnormal is because you see the brown glass opacity. The name of this is called a halo. And the reason for that is because this is all allotype, all the left of the lobe. Usually the major fissure is over here, but it's been moved this way because of atelectasis. So this increased opacity now we're looking for is this is left up of lobe atelectasis. This here is peaking of the hemidiagram or tinting of the hemidiagram caused by the pulling up of the hemidiagram from the atelectasis. And this line here. It's called a loop cycle. Have you heard that? Can they have it on your boards? A loop cycle, this linear density here, represents hyperaeration of the left lower lobe. So if the left upper lobe is collapsing, what's the left lower lobe going to do? It's going to get bigger. And so this line represents the hyperaerated left lower lobe. So left upper lobe atelectasis is a halo, tenting, and a loop cycle. Those are the findings of left upper lobe atelectasis. Do you see the left lower lobe atelectasis here? The increased density behind the eye? When you have left lower lobe atelectasis, there's usually a knot between the aorta and the pulmonary artery that rotates and becomes flat. It's called a flat waist sign. So this is left lower lobe atelectasis with a flat waist. This was a great case. On Monday morning, this patient came into our hospital feeling chest pain. They went home. On Wednesday, they came back. What changed between Monday and Wednesday in the right lung? Exactly. So he used to have blood vessels in the right lung on Monday. And on Wednesday, you appreciate that there's not as many lines. So that's Westermark sign, which is the first time I've ever seen the diagnosis made of a PE on a chest X-ray. And here we see the large central pulmonary embolism that's causing western mark sign. Masses are easy to miss and we need to all be on board to find cancers on an x-ray. Um, I'm going to give you a group of x-rays now that each have a cancer and I want you to try to find them. Um, I believe there's no bad students any bad teachers. If you don't find them, you think they're going to be a good enough job. And um, you're going to look at these and you're going to be looking very hard because I'm telling you this cancer. But I want you to be like that with every x-ray you look at. Like, you know, there's a cancer here that I've got to find. Okay, so this is the first one, and we, I'm going to go do this one with you. So when you look at an x-ray, you should always look behind your first rib. 46% of cancers are here. So look there first, look there last, keep looking there. Behind this rib as well, but more commonly this one. Underneath the hyaline here, behind the heart, and behind the diaphragm. Does anyone want to find a cancer in this patient? Let's go this is right here. In the Next one. This one is a five centimeter mass. So we're going to look behind the clavicles. They look okay. Under the hilum, behind the heart, right diaphragm, left diaphragm. You see it. So this is called the rising sun sign. This was around for a few years before we noticed it. Initially, it's just coming up a little bit. By now, it's up here like this. So on the lateral view, it's a benign fibrous tumor the pleuroid slow growing. It has a two smudges with the chest wall. It has malignant potential, so you want to recognize it and remove it. This one, we'll look at the clavicles. I'm not going to tell you. No, I probably will. <laughs> <laughs> So behind the clavicles look okay, under the hyaline. What about next to the heart? That's where the money is here. Do you see the nodule? So this is subtle, right? On the lateral, I think there's a lateral valve. So this is the mass here. 
this one or is an easier one? This one. Yes, that. Um, that's good. It's circulated mass, right? Not, an incons not a, a, a small module. This is a big module and important to recognize. The next one will be this one. I can start trying to do the same one twice. Ah, you see this one? So is it yeah, one, two, four. three, four, five, six? Yeah, I'm bringing you over to radiology. We've got a lot of films that need to be read. <laughs> you gotta come with me when we leave here. <laughs> you like the we've done a lot of experience with the radiology. A lot of x-ray. A lot of x-ray. And getting to see the patient and the x-ray is the best for you, right? Because you get to see where does it hurt to the patient or what are they feeling? It makes all the difference. Most people do radiology because they don't want to do this. Oh, Recently, you had a sick patient, not you, but somebody in this hospital had a sick patient, and I ran to go see the patient because, first of all, I one day I'm sitting at my desk, and my resident says, Oh, this patient has a pancreatic mess. You gotta look at it. I look at it, I'm like, It's not a pancreatic mess. The patient said, You want to have to right? So I said, <laughs> <laughs> So first, you have to you start, you know, start your heart again beating, and then you have to call the ER because that's where the patient was, and I called the ER, and nobody's answered the call. This is not something you can wait for the phone to be answered. So I run over to the patient and I go, Are you okay? And he goes, If you don't do something right now, I'm going to die. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have the right diagnosis. He knew he was dying. And so, you know, I had to go, you know, physically pull somebody over to the person to say, Do something. I'm a radiologist. What am I going to do for you? <laughs> <laughs> but I got the person there. Um, here we have a nodule, okay? We're going to call it one, two, three, four, I'm going to write down five and six. Can you see? So you think over here? So we're going to call this one, uh, two, three, four, five, six. Do you see it? So here is the mass. The, the lungs go pretty far down, so they don't project behind the liver on the x-ray. So you want to be able to... Um, so those are very subtle when they are located there. It's a humbling job. No wonder you didn't go into it. <laughs> I mean, I knew your job is even more humbling. So there's the nodule. Next one, do you see this one? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right there. On the cat scan. These are big. They're not little, right? They are they're challenging, though. This patient has three things going on. Which then makes it even more difficult because you're distracted, right? I mean, you see the shrapnel right away. Mm -hmm. What about the trachea? Which way is the trachea going in this person? So they have a right aortic arch. And then the cancer? Suddenly in the right lung apex. And there it is on the x ray and circulation on a plural tail. This one, I think, is not fair. But they're not always fair, these patients. So this is over here. On the cat scan. Very hard, that one. We're almost done with these. Do you find the nodule? Do I find the nodule? Do you see the nodule? If we're going to guess, you might as well say one. one. It's 46% of the time it's there. Let's go back to the x-ray for that. It was big, but central and can be very challenging. Another one. What? Why is this area? Look at all the time. Look everywhere else also. This one was hard and we didn't see it for a while. It's behind the heart. Not small. This one was hard too. Easier on the lateral. And last, I know, two more on this one. You see that behind the heart? I think seeing a series of positive things really helps you to know what they look like. So there and on the lateral, it is here. And on the CT scan, here. And finally, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, five. Five, right there. Okay. 
Okay, so that we saw twice once in that location. So really important. What's the problem with this CAT scan, this x-ray? Free air. Free air likes to go under the right hemi diaphragm first. So if I saw this only on the left, I'd be very cautious to pull free air in a terribly dilated stomach. It could be bilateral, but it's usually not just unilateral on the left, unless you rupture your posterior wall of your stomach. So if you're thinking kind of good, you have a posterior wall of the stomach rupture, and you see it on the left, you might call it. But usually it's on both sides. Line placement is so important for all right-sided catheters to stay on the right and all left-sided catheters to go to the right. When they don't do that, we recommend a, a blood gas. I've watched two people exsanguinate from having catheters and arteries that they need to be inserted, and they die. So uh, I remember the intern who has to squeeze blood into him and try to close the blood loss. So all right catheters need to stay on the right, all left catheters need to go to the right, and if they don't, we need to get a blood gas to confirm their location. Here we see an endotracheal tube. Endotracheal tubes, what do we teach you, teach you about endotracheal tubes? Where should they go? How far above the phalange should they be? What number do we use? 2.5 centimeters, they typically say. And on a portable x-ray, where everything is magnified, so you really have to measure it. And we don't know where the patient's head is. What do you think happens when you put your head down from the tube? So intuitively, you think it goes up, but the science says that it goes down. So the saying is, as goes the nose, so goes the hose. So because I don't know the position of the head, I don't overcome the position of the tracheal, in the tracheal tube. I don't get excited until the above the clavicles are very close to the carina, because I don't know where the head is. And I don't want us to misguide the So it, it can't be 2.5 exactly, because we don't know where the head is. Feeding tube should go below the diaphragm. Um, you really don't need to see how far they're going as long as they are below the diaphragm, because then you know that they're not in the wall. Next slide. Swan dance catheters shouldn't project this deep into the, the vessels. They should just go up to where the medial sternum ends. Or more proximal, but deep it can be worrisome. I've never seen a problem from a deep one, though. Have you seen um, a primary, a swan dance catheter on its way to take a problem ever? So, unfortunately, that's what I do on the cardiac ICU track. So, we see quite a bit of problem, especially when people uh, leave the balloon inflated for a few minutes, and a lot of these people have pulmonary hypertension, so we've lost a couple of patients actually, one in the cath lab and one in the ICU. So I always call about it, because I'm worried about it. I, I, when I see it deep, I, I call about it. So I kind of disagree with the pulmonologist only in the sense that the best way to know where the swan is, is, is the PA catheter <laughs> waveform. Sure. And that it should take a full 1.5 cc and a microsecond before it wedges. If it wedges before the whole balloon is full, then it's too far in. And if it, on x ray, it looks like it's too far in, but it's a PA waveform and it takes all 1.5 cc to wedge. Then it's okay. So I it alert depends you. depends on the volume and the zone distribution, the, you know, the zones of the lung. And so all I do is just say it looks deep, just check. Yeah. Um, and then we have a uh, tracheostomy tube here. This patient has severe pulmonary demoid. They have pulmonary capillary leg pressure greater than 25 because they have alveolar opacity. Next one. Chest tubes. You see this chest tube has a, a hyperdense line. Does not have a discontinuity and a hyperdense line? This represents the most proximal side hole, so you want that to at least project over the chest, say, when it is in the fill space. If this projects outside of the chest, you're going to get, you might get an air leak. Or if it straddles over the chest wall. So this discontinuous line is projected on top of the, the lung. Ah, this feeding tube is not going in the right direction, right? So it's going into the lung front. So that's why I want to see a feeding tube go below the diaphragm. Pneumothorax. I there's a lot of pneumothoraxes that we have to look out for. A lot of them are not worrisome at all, but they can get bigger. Here we see the visceral pleural line. Of a pneumothorax. This one doesn't look particularly like it's under attention, but it is sizable. So once they get to be pretty sizable, you can't really say that they're not under attention. This one, though, is much more worrisome looking, right? What are the signs we see when we have attention pneumothorax? Are going to be splaying of the ribs, shift of the mediastinum, and flattening of the, the heavy diaphragm, which is not occurring here, but just the size of it makes me worry that it's under tension. This is the last slide. This is my mom's home in Ireland. Um, this is a hook lighthouse. Have you visited Ireland? Yes, you have visited? Yes, yes. This is in County Wexford. 
and um, you can see that the water is very rough in this area. And you can imagine that because it's an island, a lot of people make their living by fishing. So, um, and they die fishing, you can so rough the water. So the sailors say to each other when they're going out fishing is, I'll either meet you by Hook Lighthouse or I'll meet you by Crook, which is another place. Meaning I'm not going to die tonight. So if I'm going out fishing, I go, I'm going to meet you by Hook or I'll meet you by Crook. That's the saying, like go break a leg when you go to a Broadway show. I'll meet you by Hook or I'll meet you by Crook. I'm not going to die tonight. And I use that as my rally cry for pulmonary fibrosis, which is my, which is my passion. By hook or by crook, if you read the x-ray as well, and the captain as well, your patients will be better. You're a wonderful audience. It's so nice to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? So is, is that the origin of the term? Yes. Hook, 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 hook. Right by your mom's home. Yes. Wow. That's her farm over here. Can we call you back? Yes, please do. And even better, come by and visit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Manny, very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You know, there's one more thing I do, which I teach the residents as an ICU doc. Yes. Tell them to always look for the ICU trifecta. So if you have an EQ, you must look for the NG2 in the center line. If you have an empty tube, look for the other two, because if you don't, you'll miss one of them. That's great. So I always push for the ICU type of I love that. I'm going to use that. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you're wearing your glasses, you can sometimes read chess. <laughs> okay, Portnoy. We made the right